Chapter forty three of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter forty three. What Henchard saw thus early was naturally enough seen at a little later date by other people. That Mr. Farfray walked with that bankrupt Henchard stepdaughter of all women became a common topic in the town, the simple perambulating term being used hereabout to signify a wooing. And the nineteen superior young ladies of Casterbridge, who had each looked upon herself as the only woman capable of making the merchant councilman happy, indignantly left off going to the church Farfray attended, left off conscious mannerisms, left off putting him in their prayers at night amongst their blood relations, in short reverted to their normal courses. Perhaps the only inhabitants of the town to whom this looming choice of the Scotchman's gave unmixed satisfaction were the members of the philosophic party which included Longways, Christopher Coney, Billy Wills, Mr. Buzzford, and the like. The three mariners having been, years before, the house in which they had witnessed the young man and woman's first and humble appearance on the Casterbridge stage, they took a kindly interest in their career, not unconnected, perhaps, with visions of festive treatment at their hands hereafter. Mrs. Stanage, having rolled into the large parlour one evening, and said that it was a wonder such a man as Mr. Farfray, a pillow of the town, who might have chosen one of the daughters of the professional men or private residents, should stoop so low, Coney ventured to disagree with her. "'No, ma'am, no wonder at all. "'Tis she that's a-stooping to he, that's my opinion. "'A widow-man whose first wife was no credit to him? "'What is it for a young perusing woman that's her own mistress and well-liked? "'But as a neat patching up of things I see much good in it. "'When a man have put up a tomb of best marble stone to the other one, as he've done, "'and weeped his fill, and thought it all over, and said to hisself, T'other took me in, I know this one first, she's a sensible piece for a partner, and there's no faithful woman in high life now. Well, he may do worse than not to take her, if she's tender inclined. Thus they talked at the mariners. But we must guard against a too liberal use of the conventional declaration that a great sensation was caused by the prospect of event, that all the gossip's tongues were set wagging thereby, and so on even though such a declaration might lend some éclat to the career of our poor only heroine. When all has been said about busy rumourers, a superficial and temporary thing is the interest of anybody in affairs which do not directly touch them. It would be a truer representation to say that Casterbridge, ever excepting the nineteen young ladies, looked up, for a moment, at the news and withdrawing its attention went on labouring and victualling bringing up its children and burying its dead without caring a tittle for farfray's domestic plans not a hint of the matter was thrown out to her stepfather by elizabeth herself or by farfray either reasoning on the cause of their reticence he concluded that estimating him by his past the throbbing pair were afraid to broach the subject and looked upon him as an irksome obstacle whom they would be heartily glad to get out of the way embittered as he was against society this moody view of himself took deeper and deeper hold of henchard till the daily necessity of facing mankind and of them particularly elizabeth jane became well-nigh more than he could endure his health declined he became morbidly sensitive he wished he could escape those who did not want him and hide his head forever. But what if he were mistaken in his views, and there were no necessity that his own absolute separation from her should be involved in the incident of her marriage? He proceeded to draw a picture of the alternative, himself living like a fangless lion about the back rooms of a house in which his stepdaughter was mistress, an inoffensive old man, tenderly smiled on by Elizabeth, and good-naturedly tolerated by her husband. It was terrible to his pride to think of descending so low. And yet, for the girl's sake, he might put up with anything, even from Farfray, even snubbings and masterful tongue-scourgings. The privilege of being in the house she occupied would almost outweigh the personal humiliation. 
whether this were a dim possibility or the reverse the courtship which it evidently now was had an absorbing interest for him elizabeth as has been said often took her walks on the budmouth road and farfrae as often made it convenient to create an accidental meeting with her there two miles out a quarter of a mile from the highway was the prehistoric fort called may dun of huge dimensions and many ramparts within or upon whose enclosures a human being as seen from the road was but an insignificant speck hitherward henchard often resorted glass in hand and scanned the hedgeless via for it was the original track laid out by the legions of the empire to a distance of two or three miles his object being to read the progress of affairs between farfrae and his charmer one day henchard was at this spot when a masculine figure came along the road from budmouth and lingered applying his telescope to his eye henchard expected that farfrae's features would be disclosed as usual but the lenses revealed that to-day the man was not elizabeth jane's lover it was one clothed as a merchant captain and as he turned in the scrutiny of the road he revealed his face henchard lived a lifetime the moment he saw it the face was newson's henchard dropped the glass and for some seconds made no other movement newson waited and henchard waited if that could be called a waiting which was a transfixture but elizabeth jane did not come something or other had caused her to neglect her customary walk that day perhaps farfrae and she had chosen another road for variety's sake but what did that amount to she might be here to-morrow and in any case newson if bent on a private meeting and a revelation of the truth to her would soon make his opportunity then he would tell her not only of his paternity but of the ruse by which he had been once sent away elizabeth's strict nature would cause her for the first time to despise her stepfather would root out his image as that of an arch deceiver and newson would reign in her heart in his stead but newson did not see anything of her that morning having stood still a while he at last retraced his steps and henchard felt like a condemned man who has a few hours respite when he reached his own house he found her there oh father she said innocently i have had a letter a strange one not signed somebody has asked me to meet him either on the budmouth road at noon to-day or in the evening at mr farfrae's he says he came to see me some time ago but a trick was played him so that he did not see me i don't understand it but between you and me i think donald is at the bottom of the mystery and that it is a relation of his who wants to pass an opinion on his choice but i did not like to go till i had seen you shall i go henchard replied heavily yes go the question of his remaining in casterbridge was for ever disposed of by this closing in of newson on the scene henchard was not the man to stand the certainty of condemnation on a matter so near his heart and being an old hand at bearing anguish in silence and haughty withal he resolved to make as light as he could of his intentions while immediately taking his measures he surprised the young woman whom he had looked upon as his all in this world by saying to her as if he did not care about her more i am going to leave casterbridge elizabeth jane leave casterbridge she cried and leave me yes this little shop can be managed by you alone as well as by us both i don't care about shops and streets and folk i would rather get into the country by myself out of sight and follow my own ways and leave you to yours she looked down and her tears fell silently it seemed to her that this resolve of his had come on account of her attachment and its probable result she showed her devotion to farfrae however by mastering her emotion and speaking out i am sorry you have decided on this she said with difficult firmness for i thought it probable possible 
that i might marry mr farfrae some little time hence and i did not know that you disapproved of the step i approve of anything you desire to do izzy said henchard huskily if i did not approve it it would be no matter i wish to go away my presence might make things awkward in the future and in short it is best that i go nothing that her affection could urge would induce him to reconsider his determination for she could not urge what she did not know that when she should learn he was not related to her other than as a step-parent she would refrain from despising him and that when she knew what he had done to keep her in ignorance she would refrain from hating him it was his conviction that she would not so refrain and there existed as yet neither word nor event which could argue it away then she said at last you will not be able to come to my wedding and that is not as it ought to be i don't want to see it i don't want to see it he exclaimed adding more softly but think of me sometimes in your future life you'll do that is he think of me when you are living as the wife of the richest the foremost man in the town and don't let my sins when you know them all cause ye to quite forget that though i love thee late i love thee well it is because of donald she sobbed i don't forbid you to marry him said henchard promise not to quite forget me when he meant when newson should come she promised mechanically in her agitation and the same evening at dusk henchard left the town to whose development he had been one of the chief stimulants for many years during the day he had bought a new tool basket cleaned up his old hay knife and wimble set himself up in fresh leggings knee-naps and corduroys and in other ways gone back to the working clothes of his young manhood discarding for ever the shabby genteel suit of cloth and rusty silk hat that since his decline had characterized him in the casterbridge street as a man who had seen better days he went secretly and alone not a soul of the many who had known him being aware of his departure elizabeth jane accompanied him as far as the second bridge on the highway for the hour of her appointment with the unguessed visitor at farfrae's had not yet arrived and parted from him with unfeigned wonder and sorrow keeping him back a minute or two before finally letting him go she watched his form diminish across the moor the yellow rush basket at his back moving up and down with each tread and the creases behind his knees coming and going alternately till she could no longer see them though she did not know it henchard formed at this moment much the same picture as he had presented when entering casterbridge for the first time nearly a quarter of a century before except to be sure that the serious addition to his years had considerably lessened the spring to his stride that his state of hopelessness had weakened him and imparted to his shoulders as weighted by the basket a perceptible bend he went on till he came to the first milestone which stood in the bank halfway up a steep hill he rested his basket on the top of the stone placed his elbows on it and gave way to a convulsive twitch which was worse than a sob because it was so hard and so dry if i had only got her with me if i only had he said hard work would be nothing to me then but that was not to be i cain go alone as i deserve an outcast and a vagabond but my punishment is not greater than i can bear he sternly subdued his anguish shouldered his basket and went on elizabeth in the meantime had breathed him a sigh recovered her equanimity and turned her face to casterbridge before she had reached the first house she was met in her walk by donald farfrae this was evidently not their first meeting that day they joined hands without ceremony and farfrae anxiously asked and is he gone and did you tell him i mean of the other matter not of ours he is gone and i told him all i knew of your friend donald who is he 
well well dearie you will know soon about that and mr henchard will hear of it if he does not go far he will go far he's bent upon getting out of sight and sound she walked beside her lover and when they reached the crossways or bow turned with him into corn street instead of going straight on to her own door at farfrae's house they stopped and went in farfrae flung open the door of the ground-floor sitting-room saying there he is waiting for you and elizabeth entered in the armchair sat the broad-faced genial man who had called on henchard on a memorable morning between one and two years before this time and whom the latter had seen mount the coach and depart within half an hour of his arrival it was richard newson the meeting with the light-hearted father from whom she had been separated half a dozen years as if by death need hardly be detailed it was an affecting one apart from the question of paternity henchard's departure was in a moment explained when the true facts came to be handled the difficulty of restoring her to her old belief in newson was not so great as might have seemed likely for henchard's conduct itself was a proof that those facts were true moreover she had grown up under newson's paternal care and even had henchard been her father in nature this father in early domiciliation might almost have carried the point against him when the incidents of her parting with henchard had a little worn off newson's pride in what she had grown up to be was more than he could express he kissed her again and again i've saved you the trouble to come and meet me ha <laughs> ha said newson the fact is that mr farfrae here he said come up and stop with me for a day or two captain newson and i'll bring her round faith says i so i will and here i am well henchard is gone said farfrae shutting the door he has done it all voluntarily and as i gather from elizabeth he has been very nice with her i was got rather uneasy but all is as it should be and we will have no more difficulties at all now that's very much as i thought said newson looking into the face of each by turns i said to myself ay a hundred times when i tried to get a peep at her unknown to herself depend upon it tis best that i should live on quiet for a few days like this till something turns up for the better i now know you are all right and what can i wish for more well captain newson i will be glad to see ye here every day now since it can do no harm said farfrae and what i've been thinking is that the wedding may as well be kept under my own roof the house being large and you being in lodgings by yourself so that a great deal of trouble and expense would be saved ye and tis a convenience when a couple's married not to hay far to go to get home with all my heart said captain newson since as ye say it can do no harm now poor henchard's gone though i wouldn't have done it otherwise or put myself in his way at all for i've already in my lifetime been an intruder into his family quite as far as politeness can be expected to put up with but what do the young woman say herself about it elizabeth my child come and hearken to what we be talking about and not bide staring out of the window as if ye didn't hear donald and you must settle it murmured elizabeth still keeping up a scrutinizing gaze at some small object in the street well then continued newson turning anew to farfrae with a face expressing thorough entry into the subject that's how we'll have it and mr farfrae as you provide so much and house-room and all that i'll do my part in the drinkables and see to the rum and skee-dum maybe a dozen jars will be sufficient as many of the folk will be ladies and perhaps they won't drink hard enough to make a high average in the reckoning but you know best i've provided for men and shipmates times enough but i'm as ignorant as a child how many glasses of grog a woman that's not a drinking woman is expected to consume at these ceremonies oh none we'll no want much of that oh no said farfrae shaking his head with appalled gravity do you leave all to me when they had gone a little further in these particulars newson leaning back in his chair and smiling reflectively at the ceiling said i've never told ye or have i mr farfrae how henchard put me off the scent that time he expressed ignorance of what the captain alluded to ah i thought i hadn't 
I resolved that I would not, I remember, not to hurt the man's name. But now he's gone, I can tell ye. Why, I came to Casterbridge nine or ten months before that day last week that I found ye out. I had been here twice before then. The first time I passed through the town on my way westward, not knowing Elizabeth lived here. Then, hearing at some place, I forget where, that a man of the name of Henchard had been mayor here, I came back, and called at his house one morning. The old rascal, he said Elizabeth Jane, had died years ago. Elizabeth now gave earnest heed to his story. Now, it never crossed my mind that the man was selling me a packet, continued Newson and if you'll believe me i was that upset that i went back to the coach that had brought me and took passage onward without lying in the town half an hour <laughs> twas a good joke and well carried out and i give the man credit for it elizabeth jane was amazed at the intelligence a joke oh no she cried then he kept you from me father all those months when you might have been here the father admitted that such was the case. "'He ought not to have done it,' said Farfray. Elizabeth sighed. "'I said I would never forget him, but, oh, I think I ought to forget him now.' Newson, like a good many rovers and sojourners among strange men and strange moralities, failed to perceive the enormity of Henchard's crime, notwithstanding that he himself had been the chief sufferer therefrom. Indeed, the attack upon the absent culprit waxing serious, he began to take Henchard's part. Well, twas not ten words that he said, after all, Newson pleaded. And how could he know that I should be such a simpleton as to believe him? Twas as much my fault as his, poor fellow. No, said Elizabeth Jane firmly in her revulsion of feeling. He knew your disposition. You always were so trusting, father. I've heard my mother say so hundreds of times, and he did it to wrong you. After weaning me from you these five years by saying he was my father, he should not have done this. Thus they conversed, and there was nobody to set before Elizabeth any extenuation of the absent one's deceit. Even had he been present, Henchard might scarce have pleaded it, so little did he value himself or his good name. "'Well, well, never mind, it is all over and past,' said Newson good-naturedly. "'Now, about this wedding again.' End of chapter 43